Okay, Professor Jake, take it away. Travels with Charlie, class eight, correct? Uh, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good morning, everyone. Today, uh, so where we last left off was page 112 of my book, where um, he's just talked with a uh, actor who roams around the country putting on little plays and monologues uh, with his dog. And uh, we're in uh, North Dakota. And so we're going to start a, an interesting part of the book that deals a lot with place and how place affects us. Um, and so this place, North Dakota, really has an effect on Steinbeck. And uh, we're going to see what that effect is. Someone must have told me about the Missouri River at Bismarck, North Dakota, or I must have read about it. In either case, I hadn't paid attention. I came on it in amazement. Here is where the map should fold. Here is the boundary between east and west. On the Bismarck side, it is eastern landscape eastern grass with the look and smell of eastern America. Across the Missouri, on the Mondan side, it is pure west with brown grass and water scorings and small outcrops. The two sides of the river might as well be a thousand miles apart. As I was not prepared for the Missouri boundary, so I was not prepared for the Badlands. They deserve this name. They are like the work of an evil child. Such a place the fallen angels might have built as a spite to heaven, dry and sharp, desolate and dangerous, and for me filled with foreboding. It's interesting, one of my good friends lives in the, in the Black Hills of South Dakota, and one of Jess's, my wife's favorite places that we've driven through several times is the Badlands. So um, it's interesting how, how much Steinbeck dislikes it. A sense comes from it that does not like or welcome humans. But humans being what they are, and I being human, I turned off the highway on a shaly road and headed in among the buttes, but with a shyness as though I crashed a party. The road surface tore viciously at my tires and made Rosinante's overloaded springs cry with anguish. What a place for a colony of troglodytes, or better, of trolls. And here's an odd thing. Just as I felt unwanted in this land, so do I feel a reluctance in writing about it. Presently, I saw a man leaning on a two-strand barbed wire fence, the wires fixed not to posts but to crooked tree limbs stuck in the ground. The man wore a dark hat and jeans and a long jacket washed palest blue with lighter places at knees and elbows. His pale eyes were frosted with sun glare and his lips scaly as snakeskin. A 22 rifle leaned against the fence beside him and on the ground lay a little heap of fur and feathers, rabbits and small birds. I pulled up to speak to him, saw his eyes wash over Rocinante, sweep up the details, and then retire into their sockets. And I found I had nothing to say to him. The looks like an early winter or any good fishing hereabouts didn't seem to apply. And so we simply brooded at each other. Afternoon. Yes, sir, he said. Any place nearby where I can buy some eggs? Not real close by, unless you want to go as far as Galva or up to beach. I was set for some scratch hen eggs. Powdered, he said. My missus gets powdered. You lived here long? Yep. I waited for him to ask something or to say something so we could go on, but he didn't. And as the silence continued, it became more and more impossible to think of something to say. I made one more try. Does it get very cold here, Winters? <laughs> Barely. <laughs> oh, you talk too much. He grinned. That's what my missus says. So long, I said, and put the car in gear and moved along. And in my rear view mirror, I couldn't see that he looked after me. He may not be a typical Badlander, but he's one of the few that I caught. A little farther along, I stopped at a small house 
a section of war surplus barracks it looked, but painted white with yellow trim and with the dying vestiges of a garden, frosted down geraniums and a few clusters of chrysanthemums, little button things, yellow and red brown. I walked up the path with the certainty that I was being regarded from behind the white window curtains. An old woman answered my knock and gave me the drink of water I asked for and nearly talked my arm off. She was hungry to talk, frantic to talk about her relatives, her friends, and how she wasn't used to this. For she was not a native and she didn't rightly belong here. So that's, you know, so it's interesting because the previous guy, he has almost taken on the silence of the landscape. And that kind of makes Steinbeck uneasy because Steinbeck lives in Long Island. And this woman is a transplant, is not from this area. And all she wants to do is talk because the silence and the area itself um, frightens her and she doesn't belong there. And so this is one of the things about the studies of place, which I have always been deeply engaged in, is the term fish out of water. Um, it's very apt when you get to a place that um, you are not from, you don't want to be in, and yet for some reason, you are either forced to be there um, or you remain there. There will always be an uneasiness about your life there. So he says, her native clime was a land of milk and honey and had its share of apes and ivory and peacocks. Whenever he wants to talk about a place that's um, very like cultural or urbane or whatever, he always says apes, ivory and peacocks. Um, it's at least three or four times that he says that in this book. Her voice rattled on as though she was terrified of the silence that would settle in when I was gone. As she talked, it came to me that she was afraid of this place and further, that so was I. I felt I would like to have the night. I felt like, I felt I wouldn't like to have the night catch me here. But this is interesting because there's gonna be a real quick switch that happens here. Um, he says, I went into a state of flight, running to get away from the unearthly landscape. And then the late afternoon changed everything. As the sun angled, the buttes and coolies, the cliffs and sculptured hills and ravines lost their burned and dreadful look and glowed with yellow and rich browns and a hundred variations of red and silver gray, all picked out by streaks of coal black. It was so beautiful that I stopped near a thicket of dwarfed and wind warped cedars and junipers. And once stopped, I was caught trapped in color and dazzled by the clarity of the light. Against the descending sun, the battlements were dark and clean lined, while to the east where the uninhibited light poured slantwise, the strange landscape shouted with color. And the night, far from being frightful, was lovely beyond thought, for the stars were close, and although there was no moon, the starlight made a silver glow in the sky. The air cut the nostrils with dry frost. And for pleasure, I collected a pile of dry dead cedar branches and built a small fire just to smell the perfume of the burning wood and to hear the excited crackle of the branches. My fire made a dome of yellow light over me and nearby I heard a screech owl hunting and a barking of coyotes, not howling, but the short chuckling bark of the dark of the moon. This is one of the few places I have ever seen where the night was friendlier than the day. And I can easily see how people are driven back to the Badlands. That is a beautiful um, paragraph. It's one long paragraph on the specialness uh, of place and where he had felt totally uneasy, which I think also had something to do with the people he was talking to. One person <laughs> was totally quiet. The other person was overly frantically talking. But when he got to be with just the land and the landscape itself, and he could see it for what it was through the late afternoon sunlight and the approaching dusk and darkness, then he was able to bond with it. Um, so it's just a beautiful um, passage. And this next paragraph will end out this thought before we go on to Montana. 
Before I slept, I spread a map on my bed, a Charlie chomped map. Beach was not far away, and that would be the end of North Dakota, and coming up would be Montana, where I had never been. That night was so cold that I put on my insulated underwear for pajamas, and when Charlie had done his duties and had his biscuits and consumed his usual gallon of water and finally curled up in his place under the bed, I dug out an extra blanket and covered him, all except the tip of his nose. And he sighed and wriggled and gave a great groan of pure ecstatic comfort. And I thought how every safe generality I gathered in my travels was canceled by another. In the night, the bad lands had become good lands. I can't explain it. That's how it was. The irony there is he just did explain it very beautifully and descriptively <laughs> on the whole last page. I mean, he, he totally explained it. He says he can't explain it, but he did. Mm. As so, I, you know, I like to interact with you all, even though we're 3,000 miles away and on technology. Um, so has any of you ever been somewhere, and this is interesting, that during the day, you didn't really like it or bond with it, but at night, it became a totally different place that you enjoy. Hmm. You think of any place? My reaction is almost always the opposite. Oh, okay. I don't think he can hear that. Oh, okay. I, I can hear it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anybody? Steve? You're muted, Steve. Sorry, right. we went to Germany while my daughter was a junior in college at Christmas. And in Hamburg, which is uh, maybe a little further north than we are, it was very short days. It's on the sea, very cloudy, very Seattle-esque. At night or about five o'clock, everything lights up because they put lights on everything. And it, it transformed this dull gray city into sort of this light lighted show. And, you had the feeling that they probably left these lights on all, all until, until April, maybe. <laughs> it, it really transformed the feeling of the place overnight like that. It really was a wonder. I think in the Northern Hemisphere, you have that. I had the same experience in Reykjavik in Iceland. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was there in the, in the late fall, early winter, and the nights were extremely short. But at night, it's like everybody came out. And, you know, 12, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, it seemed like it was more light than it was at 11 a.m. or noon, just because, and, and of course, you're just surrounded by the sea, right? Yeah. So that light even takes on more of a direct impression. Um, I, I think the, north, the northern hemisphere is very much like that. Yeah, we were there in February, and the days are really short that time of year. Uh, but there, there's a lot of light in that country natural light, the, you know, the volcanoes and the, and the areas like that. It's pretty cool. Uh, cool. All right, we will venture forth here. So now Montana. I'm going to Montana. Okay, let's see here. So the next passage in my journey is a love affair. I am in love with Montana. For other states, I have admiration, respect, recognition, even some affection, but with Montana, it is love. And it's difficult to analyze love when you're in it. All right, my next question to you is, I want everybody to name one state that they're in love with. Come on, Alan, make sure everybody kind of answers this. One state that they're in love with. Washington. Oregon. Okay, we got Oregon. I fell in love with Montana when we drove through it on our move out here, but I couldn't get convinced Bob to stop there. <laughs> so we got Oregon, Montana. Hawaii. Uh, we have Hawaii here, and I said Washington, because why not? Hawaii, Washington. Another vote for Washington. One more Washington. We have a biased crowd. <laughs> <Last year. laughs> 
Alaska. 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 I've only been there once, but Maine. Maine. Loved it on the coastline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And Steve? Oregon. All right, so, well, interestingly enough, Washington had the most votes and Oregon had the second most, and <laughs> that is your area of the country up there. Uh, cool. I, well, actually, I tell you what, I will say Maine as well, which gives Maine two votes. So there you go. And a tie with Oregon. All right. Uh, Once when I raptured in a violent glow given off by the queen of the world, my father asked me why, and I thought he was crazy not to see. So he's skipping to um, being in love with this girl when he was young um, and relating it to Montana. Of course, I now know that she was a mouse-haired, freckle-nosed, scabby-kneed little girl with a voice like a bat and the loving kindness of a gila monster. But then she... <laughs> I wonder what happened with that relationship. But then she lighted up the landscape and me. It seems to me that Montana is a great splash of grandeur. The scale is huge, but not overpowering. The land is rich with grass and color, and the mountains are the kind I would create if mountains were ever put on my agenda. Montana seems to me to be what a small boy would think Texas is like from hearing Texans. Here for the first time, I heard a definite regional accent unaffected by TVEs, a slow paced warm speech. It seemed to me that the frantic bustle of America was not in Montana. Its people did not seem afraid of shadows in a John Birch society sense. The calm of the mountains and the rolling grasslands had gotten into the inhabitants. It was hunting season when I drove through the state. The men I talked to seemed to me not moved to a riot of seasonal slaughter, but simply to be going out to kill edible meat. Again, my attitude may be informed by love, but it seemed to me that the towns were places to live in rather than nervous hives. People had time to pause in their occupations to undertake the passing art of neighborliness. I found I did not rush through the towns to get them over with. I even found things I had to buy to make myself linger. In Billings, I bought a hat. In Livingston, a jacket. In Butte, a rifle. It's funny, I stopped in all three of those towns on our journey to Washington from Florida and to Virginia from Washington. Yeah. I found, uh, then I found a telescope site I had to have and waited while it was mounted on the rifle. And in the process got to know everyone in the shop and any customers who entered. With the gun and a vise and the bolt out, we zeroed the new site on a chimney three blocks away. And later when I got to shooting the little gun, I found no reason to change it. I spent a good part of a morning at this, mostly because I wanted to stay. But I see that as usual, love is inarticulate. Montana has a spell on me. It is a grandeur and warmth. If Montana had a seacoast, or if I could live away from the sea, I would instantly move there and petition for admission. Of all the states, it is my favorite and my love. At Custer, we made a side trip south to pay our respects to General Custer and Sitting Bull on the battlefield of Little Bighorn. I don't suppose there is an American who doesn't carry Remington's painting of the last defense of the center column of the seventh cavalry in his head. I removed my hat in memory of brave men and Charlie saluted in his own manner, but I thought with great respect. <laughs> the whole of Eastern Montana and the Western Dakotas is memory marked as Indian country and the memories are not very old either. Some years ago, my neighbor was Charles Erskine Scott Wood, who wrote Heavenly Discourse. He was a very old man when I knew him, but as a young lieutenant just out of the military academy, he had been assigned to General Miles, and he served in the Chief Joseph campaign. His memory of it was very clear and very sad. He said it was one of the most gallant retreats in all history. Chief Joseph and the Nez Pierce with squaws and children, dogs and all their possessions, retreated under heavy fire for over a thousand miles, trying to escape to Canada. 
Wood said they fought every step of the way against odds until finally they were surrounded by the cavalry under General Miles and a large part of them wiped out. It was the saddest duty he had ever performed. Wood said, and he had never lost his respect for the quite fighting qualities of the Nez Pearsons. Quote, if they hadn't had their families with them, we would have never had caught them, he said. And if we had been evenly matched in men and weapons, we couldn't have beaten them. They were men, he said, real men. So that's another aside there um, that he puts in there, a historical aside that has to do with place. And then, he, and then with the place, he has a memory of his neighbor, who's a famous author and was in the military. And then he puts that in there. So this is all part of his, what we call his literary devices, um, which Steinbeck is a, is a master at. And now this is, I mean, I say this about a lot of places, but this is one of my favorite because Charlie is front and center in this next, um, next passage, which I call Charlie and the Bears. I must confess to a laxness in the matter of national parks. I haven't visited many of them. Perhaps this is because they enclose the unique, the spectacular, the astounding, the greatest waterfall, the deepest canyon, the highest cliff, the most stupendous works of man or nature. And I would rather see a good Brady photograph than Mount Rushmore, for it is my opinion that we enclose and celebrate the freaks of our nation and of our civilization. Yellowstone National Park is no more representational of America than is Disneyland. <laughs> you may or may disagree with that. I have a lot of students who disagree with this, that, <laughs> that he doesn't like national parks, but this being my natural attitude, I don't know what made me turn sharply south and cross a state line to take a look at Yellowstone. Perhaps it was a fear of my neighbors. I could hear them say, you mean you were that near to Yellowstone and you didn't go? You must be crazy. Again, it might have been the American tendency in travel. One goes not so much to see, but to tell afterward. Whatever my purpose in going to Yellowstone, I'm glad I went because I discovered something about Charlie I might never have known. A pleasant looking national park man checked me in and then he said, how about that dog? They aren't permitted in except on a leash. Why, I asked, because of the bears. Sir, I said, this is a unique dog. He does not live by tooth or fang. He respects the right of cats to be cats, although he doesn't necessarily admire them. He turns his steps rather than disturb an earnest caterpillar. His greatest fear is that someone will point out a rabbit and suggest that he chase it. This is a dog of peace and tranquility. I suggest that the greatest danger to your bears is that they will be peak at being ignored by Charlie. <laughs> the young man laughed. I wasn't so much worried about the bears, he said, but our bears have developed an intolerance for dogs. One of them might demonstrate his prejudice with a clip on the chin and then no dog. I'll lock him in the back, sir. I promise you Charlie will cause no ripple in the bear world. And as an old bear looker, Neither will I. I just have to warn you, he said. I have no doubt your dog has the best of intentions. On the other hand, our bears have the worst. Don't leave food about. Not only do they steal, but they are critical of anyone who tries to reform them. In a word, don't believe their sweet faces or you might get clobbered and don't let the dog wander. Bears don't argue. We went on our way into the wonderland of nature gone nuts. And you will have to believe what happened. The only way I can prove it would be to go and get a bear. Less than a mile from the entrance, I saw a bear beside the road and it ambled out as though to flag me down. Instantly, <laughs> a change came yeah. over Charlie. He shrieked with rage. His lips flared, showing wicked teeth that have some trouble with a dog biscuit. He screeched insults at the bear, which hearing the bear reared up and seemed to me <laughs> to overtop Rosinante. Frantically, I rolled the windows shut and swinging quickly to the left, grazed the animal 
then scuttled on while Charlie raved and ranted beside me. So he's seeing a whole different uh, nature <laughs> of Charlie. I was never so astonished in my life. To the best of my knowledge, Charlie had never seen a bear and in his whole history had showed great tolerance for every living thing. Besides all this, Charlie is a coward. So deep seated a coward that he has developed a technique for concealing it. And yet he showed every evidence of wanting to get out and murder a bear that outweighed him a thousand to one. And I don't understand it. A little <laughs> farther along, two bears showed up and the effect was doubled. Charlie became a maniac. He leaped all over me. He cursed and growled, snarled and screamed. I didn't know he had the ability to snarl. Uh, hold on, lost my place for a second. Oh, where did he learn it? Bears were in good supply, and so the road <laughs> became a nightmare. For the first time in his life, Charlie resisted reason, he even resisted a cuff on the ear. He became a primitive killer, lusting for the blood of his enemy. And up to this moment, he had had no enemies. In a bearless stretch, I opened the cab, took Charlie by the collar, and locked him in the house. But that did no good. When we passed other bears, he leaped on the table and scratched at the windows trying to get out of them. I could hear canned goods crashing as he struggled <laughs> with the maniac. Bears simply brought out the hide in my jekyll-headed dog. What could have caused it? Was it a pre-breed memory of a time when the wolf was in him? I know him well. Once in a while he tries a bluff, but it is a palpable lie. I swear that this was no lie. I am certain that if he were released, he would have charged every bear we passed and found either victory or death. It was too nerve wracking, a shocking spectacle. spectacle like seeing an old, calm friend go insane. No amount of natural wonders of rigid cliffs and belching waters and smoking springs could even engage my attention while that pandemonium went on. After about the fifth encounter, I gave up, turned Rosinante about, and retraced my way. If I had stopped the night and bears had gathered to my cooking, I dare not think what would have happened. At the gate, the park guard checked me out. You didn't stay long. Where's the dog? Locked up back there. And I owe you an apology. That dog has the heart and soul of a bear killer and I didn't know it. Heretofore, he has been a little tender hearted toward an underdone steak. Yeah, he said, that happens sometimes. That's why I warned you. A bear dog would know his chances, but I've seen a Pomeranian go up like a puff of smoke. You know, a well-favored bear can bat a dog like a tennis ball. I moved fast back the way I had come and I was reluctant to camp for fear that there might be some unofficial non-government bears about. That night I spent in a pretty auto court near Livingston. I had my dinner in a restaurant and when I had settled in with a drink and a comfortable chair and my bathed bare feet on a carpet with red roses, I inspected Charlie. He was dazed. His eyes held a faraway look and he was totally exhausted, emotionally, no doubt. Mostly he reminded me of a man coming out of a long, hard drunk, worn out, depleted, collapsed. He couldn't eat his dinner. He refused the evening walk. And once we were in, he collapsed on the floor and went to sleep. In the night, I heard him whining and yapping. And when I turned on the light, his feet were making running gestures and his body jerked and his eyes were wide open. But it was only a night bear ah, instead of a nightmare. There you go. Yeah. I awakened him and gave him some water. And this time he went to sleep and didn't stir all night. In the morning, he was still tired. I wonder why we think the thoughts and emotions of animals are simple. <laughs> And I love that 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 portion of the book. <laughs> Has anybody ever been to Yellowstone? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you people see bears? 
I don't think we I did. I don't think we did. We saw everything else there is to see there. No bears, so you no don't bears. know if you, you don't know if you like Charlie would go insane instantaneously. <laughs> well, actually, the first time we had our dog with us, yeah. didn't we? And who slept in the tent with us at night, and um, I mean, he didn't encounter any any animals. And he was a fierce little guy. <laughs> yeah, we saw bears when we were there, but uh, they weren't interested in us. They were more interested in getting the ants out of logs. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I love how deeply he goes into describing Charlie, his post-traumatic kind of syndrome. Yeah. Um, you know, he, he cares so deeply for Charlie. You know, it's like his personality. He understands his dog very deeply, except with the bears. But then he, you know, he had just never seen a bear before. So, all right. I remember as a child reading or hearing the words, the great divide and being stunned by the glorious sound, a proper sound for the granite backbone of a continent. And that is a beautiful image the granite backbone of a continent. That, that's really beautiful. That would make, I guess, the, the creator a, a great chiropractor. I saw in my mind escarpments rising into the clouds, a kind of natural great wall of China. The Rocky Mountains are too big, too long, too important to have to be imposing. In Montana, to which I had returned, the rise is gradual. And were it not for a painted sign, I never would have known when I crossed it. It wasn't very high as elevations go. I passed it as I saw the sign, but I stopped and backed up and got out and straddled it. As I stood over it facing south, it had a strange impact on me that rain falling on my right foot must fall into the Pacific Ocean, while that on my left foot would eventually find its way after uncountable miles to the Atlantic. The place wasn't impressive enough to carry a stupendous fact like that. It is impossible to be in this high spinal country without giving thought to the first men who crossed it, the French explorers, the Lewis and Clark men. We fly it in five hours, drive it in a week, dawdle it as I was doing in a month or six weeks, but Lewis and Clark and their party started in St. Louis in 1804 and returned in 1806. And if we get to thinking we are men, we might remember that in the two and a half years of pushing through wild and unknown country to the Pacific Ocean and then back, only one man died and only one deserted. And we get sick if the milk delivery is late and nearly die of heart failure if there is an elevator strike. What must these men have thought as a really new world unrolled? Or was the progress so slow that the impact was lost. It's a really interesting and deep question to think about. You know, here this whole new world that people from their neck of the woods have never explored before, but is the impact kind of lessened or deadened because they're doing it in so slow a fashion, right? Whereas when people fly or take a train or drive, you can see these huge differences in landscape as, as Steinbeck is relating to us. So how we travel makes a big difference in the way that we experience the locations that we're traveling through. Uh, and this is something that I try to get across to my students a lot so that when they do decide to go on a trip, they think very seriously about what mode of travel they're going to use because it will affect the trip greatly. If you ride a donkey, it's a lot different uh, <laughs> than, than taking a train or a Lincoln town car or you know an airplane. What must, uh, I can't believe they were unimpressed by the changes. Certainly their report to the government is an excited and an exciting document. They were not confused. They knew what they had found. I drove across the upraised thumb of Idaho and through real mountains that climbed straight up, tufted with pines and deep dusted with snow. Now he's getting closer to you all out there. My radio went dead and I thought it was broken, but it was only that the high ridges cut off the radio waves. The snow started to fall, but my luck held for it was only a light gay snow. 
The air was softer than it had been on the other side of the Great Divide, and I seem to remember reading that the warm airs from over the Japanese current penetrate deep inland. The underbrush was thick and very green, and everywhere was a rush of waters. The roads were deserted except for an occasional hunting party in red hats and yellow jackets, and sometimes with a deer or an elk draped over the hood of the car. A few mountain cabins were incised into the street steep slopes, but not many. I was having to make many stops for Charlie's sake. Charlie was having increasing difficulty in evacuating his bladder, which is Nelly talk for the sad symptoms of not being able to pee. <laughs> this sometimes caused him pain and always caused him embarrassment. Consider this dog of great alarm of impeccable manner, of ton, and fin of a certain majesty. Not only did he hurt, but his feelings were hurt. So again, he's so, like so deeply engaged with the relationship and personality of this dog. It's very interesting. I would stop beside the road and let him wander and turn my back on him in kindness. It took him a very long time. If it had happened to a human male, I would have thought it was prostatitis. Charlie is an elderly gentleman of the French persuasion. The only two ailments the French will admit to are that and a bad liver. And so while waiting for him and pretending to inspect plants and small water courses, I tried to reconstruct my trip as a single piece and not as a series of incidents. What was I doing wrong? Was it going as I wished? Remember, he did this... Um, back in, I believe it was South Dakota as well at a campground. He kind of like was questioning his trip and trying to piece it together. So this is something that's weighing on him now. Because remember, he's not just going on this trip to rediscover America, he's going on this trip as a writer as well. Um, and I guess at this point, he's finding it difficult to understand what it is that he's actually experiencing. <clears throat> was it all going as I wished? Before I left, I was briefed, instructed, directed, and brainwashed by many of my friends. One among them is a well-known and highly respected political reporter. He had been grassrooting with the presidential candidates, and when I saw him, he was not happy because he loves his country and he felt a sickness in it. I might say further that he is a completely honest man. He said bitterly, if anywhere in your travels you come on a man with guts, mark the place. I want to go see him. I haven't seen anything but cowardice and expediency. This used to be a nation of giants. Where have they gone? You can't defend a nation with a board of directors. That takes men. Where are they? Must be somewhere, I said. Well, you try to root a few out. We need them. I swear to God, the only people in this country with any guts seem to be Negroes. Mind you, he said, I don't want to keep Negroes out of the hero business, but I'm damned if I want them to corner the market. You dig me up 10 white, able-bodied Americans who aren't afraid to have a conviction, an idea, or an opinion in an unpopular field, and I'll have the major part of a standing army. His obvious worry in this matter impressed me, so I did listen and look along the way. And it is true, I didn't hear many convictions. I saw only two real man fights with bare fists and enthusiastic inaccuracy, and both of these were over women. Charlie came back apologizing for needing more time. I wished I could help him, but he wanted to be alone. And I remembered another thing my friend said, quote, there used to be a thing or a commodity we put great store by. It was called the people. Find out where the people have gone. I don't, mean the, I don't mean the square eyed toothpaste and hair dye people or the new car or bus people or the success and coronary people. Maybe they never existed, but if there ever were the people, that's the commodity the declaration was talking about and Mr. Lincoln. Come to think of it, I've known a few, but not many. Wouldn't it be silly if the constitution had been talking about a young man whose life centers around a whistle, a wink and wild root? I remember retorting to him, maybe the people are always those who used to live the generation before last. <laughs> Charlie was pretty stiff. I had to help him into the cab of Rosinante and we proceeded up the mountain. 
a very light, dry snow, blue light, white dust on the highway, and the evening was coming earlier now, I thought. Just under the ridge of a pass, I stopped for gasoline in a little put-together, do-it-yourself group of cabins, square boxes, each with a stoop, a door, and one window, and no vestige of a garden or gravel paths. The small, the small combined store, repair shop, and lunchroom behind the gas pumps was, an unpre was as unprepossessing as any I have ever seen. The blue restaurant signs were old and autographed, by the flies of many past summers. I'm gonna read that again because that is a beautiful <laughs> poetic description. The blue restaurant signs were old and autographed by the flies of many past summers. That is about as good as it gets, my friends. <laughs> quote, quote, pies like mother would have made if mother could have cooked. Quote, we don't look in your mouth, don't look in our kitchen. Quote, no checks cashed unless accompanied by fingerprints. <laughs> the standard old ones. There would be no cellophane on the food here. <laughs> no one came to the gas pump, so I went into the lunchroom. A sound of a quarrel came from the back room, which was probably the kitchen. A deep voice and a lighter male voice yammering back and forth. I called, anybody home? And the voices stopped. Then a burly man came through the door, still scowling from the fracas. Want something? Fill up of gas, but if you have a cabin, I might stay the night. Take your pick, ain't a soul here. Can I have a bath? I'll bring you a bucket of hot water. Winter rates, $2. Good. Can I get something to eat? Baked ham and beans, ice cream. Okay. I've got a dog. It's a free country. <laughs> the cabins are all open. Take your pick. Sing out if you need something. Man, $2 and you get dinner. That's pretty good. <laughs> no effort had been spared to make the cabins uncomfortable and ugly. <laughs> the bed was lumpy, the walls a dirty yellow, the curtains like the underskirts of a slattern. <laughs> And the close room had a mixed aroma of mice and moisture, mold and the smell of old, old dust. But the sheets were clean, and a little airing got rid of the memories of old inhabitants. A naked globe hung from the ceiling, and the room was heated by kerosene stove. <laughs> there was a knock on the door, and I admitted a young man of about 20, dressed in gray flannel slacks, two-toned shoes, a polka dotted ascot and a blazer with the badge of a Spokane high school. His dark shining hair was a masterpiece of overcombing. The top hair laid back and crisscrossed with long side strands that just cleared the ears. He was a shock to me after the ogre of the lunch counter. Here's your hot water, he said, and his, and his was the voice of the other quarreler. The door was open and I saw his eyes go over Rosinante and linger on the license plate. You really from New York? Yep. I want to go there sometimes. Everybody there wants to come out here. What for? There's nothing here. You can just rot here. If it's rotting you want, you can do it any place. I mean, there's no chance for advancing yourself. What do you want to advance toward? Well, you know, there's no theater, no music, no one to talk to. Why, it's even hard to get late magazines unless you subscribe. So you read The New Yorker? How did you know? I subscribe. <laughs> and Time Magazine? <laughs> of course. Well, you don't have to go anywhere. Beg pardon? You've got the world at your fingertips, the world of fashion, of art, and the world of thought right in your own backyard. Going would only confuse you further. And yet here Steinbeck is 3,000 miles away in a turtle shell that he's driving around the country telling this guy he doesn't need to go anywhere. <laughs> One likes to see for oneself, he said, and I swear he said it. That your father? Yeah, yes, but I'm more like an orphan. All he likes is fishing and hunting and drinking. And what do you like? I want to get ahead in the world. 
I'm 20 years old. I've got to think about my future. There he is yelling for me. He can't say anything without yelling. You going to eat with us? Sure. I bathed slowly in the crusted, galvanized bucket. For a moment, I thought of digging out New York clothes and putting on a puff for the boy. But I dropped that one and settled for clean chino slacks and a knitted shirt. The burly proprietor's face was red as a ripe raspberry when I went into the lunch counter. He thrust his jaw at me. <laughs> As if I ain't carrying enough trouble and you got to go and be from New York. <laughs> is that bad? For me, it is. I just got that kid quieted down and you put burrs under his blanket. I didn't give New York a good name. No, but you come from there and now he's all riled up again. Oh, hell, what's the use? He's no damn good around here. Come on, you might as well eat with us out back. Out back was kitchen, larder, pantry, dining room and the cot covered with army blankets made it bedroom too. A great Gothic wood stove clicked and purred. We were to eat at a square table covered with white knife-scarred oil cloth. The keyed up boy dished up bowls of bubbling navy beans and fat back. I wonder if you could rig me a reading light. Hell, I turn off the generator when we go to bed. I can give you a coal oil lamp. Pull up. Got a canned baked ham in the oven. The moody boy served the beans listlessly. The red-faced man spoke up. I thought he'd just finish high school and that would be the end of it, but not him, not Robbie. He took a night course, now get this, not in high school. He paid for it. Don't know where he got the money. Sounds pretty ambitious. Ambitious, my big fat foot. You don't know what the course was. Hairdressing, not barbering, hairdressing for women. Now maybe you see why I got worries. <sighs> Robbie turned from carving the ham. The slender knife was held rigidly in his right hand. He searched my face for the look of contempt he expected. I strove to look stern, thoughtful, and non-committal all at once. I pulled at my beard, which is said to indicate concentration. <laughs> Whatever I say, one or the other of you is going to sick the dog on me. You got me in the middle. Papa took a deep breath and let it out slowly. By God, you're right, he said, and then he chuckled and the tension went out of the room. Robbie brought the plates of ham to the table and he smiled at me, I think, in gratitude. Now that we got our hackles down, what do you think of this hairdressing beautician stuff, Papa said? You're not going to like what I think. How do I know if you don't say it? Well, okay, but I'm going to eat fast in case I have to run for it. I went through my beans and half of my ham before I answered him. All right, I said, you've hit on a subject I've given a lot of thought to. I know quite a few women and girls, all ages, all kinds, all shapes, no two alike except in one thing, the hairdresser. It is my considered opinion that the hairdresser is the most influential man in any community. You're making a joke. I am not. I've made a deep study of this. <laughs> Steinbeck is quite the ruse. When women go to the hairdresser, and they all do if they can afford it, something happens to them. They feel safe. They relax. They don't have to keep up any kind of pretense. The hairdresser knows what their skin is like under the makeup. He knows their age, their face liftings. This being so, women tell a hairdresser things they wouldn't dare confess to a priest, and they are open about matters they try to conceal from a doctor. You don't say. I do say. I tell you I'm a student of this. <laughs> when women place their secret lives in the hairdresser's hands, he gains an authority few other men ever attain. I have heard hairdressers quoted with complete conviction in art, literature, politics, economics, childcare, and morals. I think you're kidding, but on the level. <laughs> I'm not smiling when I say it. I tell you that a clever, thoughtful, ambitious hairdresser wields a power beyond the comprehension of most men. <laughs> Jesus Christ, you hear that, Robbie? Did you know that? <laughs> Some of it, why in the course I took, there was a whole section on psychology. I never would have thought it, Papa said. Say, how about a little drink? Thanks, not tonight, my dog's not well. 
I'm going to push on early and try to find a vet. Well, I tell you what, Robbie will rig up a reading light for you. I'll leave the generator on. Will you want some breakfast? I don't think so. I'm going to get an early start. When I came to my cabin, after trying to help Charlie in his travail, Robbie was tying a trouble light to the iron frame of my sad bed. He said quietly, Mister, I don't know if you believe all that you said, but you sure gave me a hand up. You know, I think most of it might be true. If it is, that's a lot of responsibility, isn't it, Robbie? It sure is, he said solemnly. It was a restless night for me. <clears throat> I had rented a cabin not nearly as comfortable as the one I carried with me. And once installed, I had interfered in a matter that was none of my business. And while it is true that people rarely take action on the advice of others unless they were going to do it anyway, there was the small chance that in my enthusiasm for my hairdressing thesis, I might have raised up a monster. In the middle of the night, Charlie awakened me with a soft apologetic whining. And since he is not a whining dog, I got up immediately. He was in trouble. His abdomen distended and his nose and ears hot. I took him out and stayed with him, but he could not relieve pressure. Oh, no. I wish I knew something of veterinary medicine. There's a feeling of helplessness with a sick animal. It can't explain, it can't explain how it feels, though on the other hand, it can't lie, build up its symptoms or indulge in the pleasures of hypochondria. I don't mean they are incapable of faking. Even Charlie, who is as honest as they come, is prone to limp when his feelings are hurt. I wish someone would write a good, comprehensive book of home dog medicine. I would do it myself if I were qualified. Charlie was a really sick dog and due to get sicker unless I could find some way to relieve the growing pressure. A catheter would do it, but who has one in the mountains in the middle of the night? I had a plastic tube for siphoning gasoline, but the diameter was too great. Then I remembered something about pressure causing muscular tension, which increases the pressure, etc., so that the first step is to relax the muscles. My medicine chest was not designed for general practice, but I did have a bottle of sleeping pills, Secanol, one and a half grains. But how about dosage? That is where the home medicine book would be helpful. I took a capsule apart and unloaded half of it and fitted it together again. I slipped the capsule back beyond the bow in Charlie's tongue where he could not push it out and then held up his head and massaged it down his throat. Then I lifted him on the bed and covered him. At the end of an hour, there was no change in him. So I opened a second capsule and gave him another half. I think that for his weight, one and a half grains is a pretty heavy dose, but Charlie must have a high tolerance. He resisted it for three quarters of an hour before his breathing slowed and he went to sleep. I must have dozed off too. The next thing I knew, he hit the floor. In his drugged condition, his legs buckled under him. He got up, stumbled, and got up again. I opened the door and let him out. Well, the method worked all right, but I don't see how one medium-sized dog's body could have held that much liquid. <laughs> well, he does drink a gallon of water every night. Uh, where, where am I here? Uh, right. Finally, he staggered in and collapsed on a piece of carpet and was asleep immediately. He was so completely out that I worried over the dosage. But his temperature had dropped and his breathing was normal and his heartbeat was strong and steady. My sleep was restless and when dawn came, I saw that Charlie had not moved. I awakened him and he was quite agreeable when I got his attention. He smiled, yawned, and went back to sleep. That's going to be all for today. And tomorrow we will meet the vet who Charlie does not respect. <laughs> well, not tomorrow, but next week we will meet the vet who Charlie does not respect. Uh, so, yes, that's a, you know, I mean, this book has so many great parts to it. Um, this part is much more dedicated to Charlie because he is going through a health issue. Um, so he will become much more of a focus uh, of this part. 
uh, and then Steinbeck will go into Seattle and he has a lot to say about Seattle since the last time he visited it. So it'll be interesting to hear how much more it's changed since 1960, 61. All right. I will see you all next Monday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a lovely week, everybody.